So this is a TLDR of Kubernetes. It was originally like an introduction to machine learning and microservices. And I'm like, okay, I gotta slow down because we, we gotta we gotta go with the, the foundational stuff here. So um, I, I sort of just took it back and went into Kubernetes. We'll do a little microservice stuff, but we won't do so much machine learning and microservices, right? So who am I? I'm Nick Sassenti, I'm a Townsend alum, self-taught data science scientist. Uh, Emily and I were just talking about this. Um, I have learned a lot off of Udemy. Uh, I work for Parsons at uh, Army Research Labs. We're looking for interns. I just got engaged uh, like two weeks ago. Um, and personal projects I'm working on, I have a Pi cluster, which is running uh, Kubernetes and Ceph. I'm building an AI-driven, uh, com uh, computer vision-driven machine learning Super Smash Brothers bot for the uh, the GameCube Super Smash Bros. Melee. Uh, TLDR, which is, uh, I don't know if you can see this, this is TLDR. <clears throat> it's complete with memes and GIFs to keep it interesting, but it's just all of the documentation for a lot of technologies just written, rewritten to make it way more digestible. Um, and then human analytics, which is a project I'm gonna be doing shortly um, using data from the government to like, to help people who might be disenfranchised. Um, that's coming in a couple of months. Uh, this is one of my favorite memes. Um, I, I don't know if this is getting cut off. <clears throat> Let me do that. Move that there. <clears throat> so basically, this this little comic is saying, you know, I need to know why moving our app to the cloud didn't automatically solve all of our problems. Uh, well, you wouldn't let me re-architect the app to be cloud native. Just put it in containers. Uh, you can't solve a problem just by saying techy things. Kubernetes. This is literally a conversation I had with um, one of the generals that I work with. Um, the, the, the people that, that you tend to work with, um, if you go into technology, and if you're not necessarily in like a technology focused company or organization, you'll have a lot of people who just like sort of take technology for granted. So they just throw Kubernetes around. It's like, oh yeah, just do this. It's like, that's not that simple. Um, so first we have to start off with what a container is. Um, again, if I'm like oversimplifying it, I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm hoping I'm not like talking down. This is like the, the, the most basic thing that I can start with. But a container is a standardized unit that packages all code and dependencies into a lightweight executable package that can run on any OS um, with some restrictions. Um, so if I build a container that runs on Mac OS, it should run on Linux, it should run on Windows. It will not run across ARM versus x86. So if I write an application to run, or if I build a container to run on my desktop machine, it won't work on one of my Raspberry Pis, uh, and vice versa, right? So you'd have to recompile the container or rebuild it, right? And these are some of the daemons you might see: uh, Docker, Podman, Singularity, and Rocket. Docker is the big one, obviously. <clears throat> So what's Kubernetes? Kubernetes is a service that runs on top of existing hardware, software, and file system to abstract container orchestration. Now that word is common, or that phrase is commonly used, container orchestration, but it's sort of intentionally vague. It can be any of these things, deployment of containers, scaling of containers, managing them, like deleting them, updating them, backing them up, load balancing containers. So if you have one single endpoint and you have multiple people accessing that container, it's gonna get bogged down, so you wanna you know, balance that load. Health checks, make sure your container hasn't died or bugged out. Um, Rollups or rollouts and backups. Um, like if you push an update, we want it to like smoothly uh, to sort of like uh, do the Indiana Jones swap with the crystal skull and the, the duffel bag or whatever he did. You know, it was like, so if you're net, if you're um, Amazon and you have your front end running um, in, in a container, you can't afford to take that container down. You need to put up a new container, uh, route traffic to that new container, and then once that's confirmed to be working, then you can kill the old one, right? So that's what a rollout is. And we'll get into that a little later. <clears throat> Job distribution. Um, if you're working with Kubernetes, you're probably working um, on a cluster that is multiple data centers spread throughout the entire world. Netflix has data centers literally all throughout the world. They typically all run on AWS, AWS, which is all throughout the world. Um, you do that for a couple of reasons for like, um, uh, like if there's a, like a natural disaster, like an earthquake or something, and it takes that, that data center out, your entire infrastructure is not shot. You, know, it's, you have that sort of that insurance. All right, but Kubernetes is all of these things and it does a lot more than this. Um, that's why it's become a buzzword. So 
this is where we're going to get a little gritty. So pods are the most atomic unit in Kubernetes. And typically you, so you don't really touch containers, right? You, you put containers inside of pods. You can put many containers inside of pods. Um, really, you don't really touch pods. I mean, you can, but you don't, you don't really want to. And, and I know I'm, I'm sort of talking in circles here. So in, 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 in Kubernetes, we put containers inside of pods, right? So here, this is a YAML file. And in Kubernetes, YAML is sort of like, it's not really a programming language. People think you know, it shouldn't be, but in, in Kubernetes, this is how we deliver instructions to the API server that, that Kubernetes is running. So let's, let's break this, this YAML down. So first we see API version, version one. So you can kind of think about that, like the version of the Java compiler you're using or a version of an interpreter you're using. The kind of object you're being, that you're creating. Here we're making a pod object. Um, there's the metadata, so you'll give it a name, which is mandatory, and then labels. Now, labels can be anything you want, and the labels are used by something called selectors, which we'll go into detail a little bit later. Um, but here you can see I wrote nonsensical baloney equals boop, you put whatever you want there, it doesn't matter. It's, it's for you to use. Um, and section four down here is the desired state of the object. So we're going to create a pod, and in that pod, you're going to have the following containers. So you're going to have a container named nginx container and we're going to pull from docker nginx and it's probably going to be latest right so if you've ever used docker you know like hub.docker.com you can pull containers from the docker registry um, and if all of this sounds like magic and like you've never heard of this before um, you can create a container in in uh, on your local machine you can push it up to the docker cloud right and then you can pull those containers for everyone to use and um, like Ubuntu, um, who, who owns Ubuntu? I'm, I'm, Canonical. If so, Canonical will have a build tool continuously building like the latest version of Ubuntu, like bug fixes and stuff, right? And they'll constantly beam it up to Docker because so many organizations and companies use Docker and rely on those containers being up to date. <clears throat> um, but yeah, so this is a YAML. It's it's ugly, but it's not terrible. Um, and once you sort of get the hang of it, it's not that bad. So from here, we have an Nginx container inside of a pod. Remember, we said that we can have multiple containers inside of a pod. Now we're going to go into controllers. And this is where Kubernetes really shines. Um, so remember what I said, we're not going to be using, um, we're not going to really interact with pods by themselves that much. That's sort of an uncommon thing to do, unless you're like, you know, debugging or bug fixing or whatever. Typically, you're going to let a controller do everything that you can. So a controller is a Kubernetes object that provides an abstraction for orchestrating pods. And there's a, oh, there's a couple names for them, replica set, deployment job. And none of these names might mean anything to you right now, but we're, we're gonna go into a couple of them. Um, and all they do is provide like sort of an autonomous way to monitor uh, pods that have been deployed. It's a way to make sure that if pods die, you can repair them uh, and so on. So we're gonna start off with jobs, right? So, <clears throat> So this is what a job might look like, right? So here we're using the API version V1. We're creating a pod, the kind is pod. The metadata, that's your, your third block. We're gonna name it math pod. And the spec is the specified state of the, of the pod that we're gonna create. So our spec is we want a container called math add. Doesn't matter what you call it. Uh, we're gonna pull Ubuntu latest and we're gonna run just three plus two, right? We're gonna introduce a new concept called restart policy. Um, and so here we're using restart policy on failure. Now here's what the restart policies do. Um, so the part, the pod can either restart forever. Um, it can fail once and never restart. Or in our case, what we care about on failure is causes the pod to restart when it fails. So if it succeeds, it won't rerun it, right? So we're gonna take all of this, all of these guts for a pod, right? And we're gonna to grip them out and we're going to throw them inside of a like a, a, a YAML file uh, for constructing a job in Kubernetes. So here we're using the API version batch one. Again, it's not something you have to remember. Um, don't memorize the, the API versions. You can usually find like a document or something. Um, also, the Kubernetes command line will yell at you pretty consistently if you're using the wrong version. We're creating a kind job object. The metadata is the, the name, map add job. Um, and then we're, we're introducing a new concept. And I know I'm just, this is just like light speed, right? But 
in our spec, the specified state of the, the object in Kubernetes that we're creating, we're going to create it, we're going to give it a template. And we're going to say, okay, so if none of our, if, if, if our specifications for this job aren't met, you're going to create a new pod that follows this template. And you'll notice that the template looks pretty identical to the pod constructor that we had just seen, right? And so that's sort of how we inform Kubernetes how to move things around. Uh, number two down here is the number of pod completions, no failures or term terminations. Um, so we're, we're expecting a pod to run three times. So three completions. And then we have the number of pods to be running at once in parallel, three. So for adding, it doesn't really make sense. Um, but if you were doing like, um, like if you were writing like a search engine uh, and you needed to like, if you, okay, distribute this job and the job is just like search for pictures of cats all across all, across all the clusters, right? You can distribute a job, you have a job, distribute pods that run the search for pictures of cats all across the, the, the world. And it'll, with some degree of parallelism, run that and return it back to the pictures of cats to you. I mean, I'm doing some hand waving here, obviously, but it's a, it's a good example. Search engine is a great example of that. And then here's like a little graphic, a little abstraction I made for that. Um, Next, replica sets, which is um, another very popular thing that you might run into. And um, again, I'm doing a lot of hand waving here. I'm not talking about security or anything yet. I mean, get it running the first time before you worry about securing it, I guess. Um, I'm probably going to regret saying that in five years. Um, but replica sets provide scalar availability. So if you had a service that needed to scale upward, like say, um, like Netflix's recommendation engine, the more users you have, the more instances you would have to deploy of a recommendation model. So you can use a replica set to accomplish that. And if we, in this case, I think we're using an Nginx container for like serving web traffic, but it doesn't matter what you want it to use for that. So here we're using the API version, kind replica set, the metadata, again, the name, you can name whatever you want, the labels, put whatever you want there, guess what, chicken butt, spec. Now this is spec is important, the spec tells uh, the uh, tells Kubernetes how to do things. So one, we're giving it a template again. So our template here is if our um, if our conditions are not met, we're going to create a, a pod with the metadata my app pod with the my the name. Um, we're going to give it the following labels: app, my app type, front end, boot, blarp. Uh, and we're going to pass that in nested specs. And it's getting, it's sort of a nested, it's kind of a mess. Um, someone needs to rethink the YAML for, for Kubernetes. But anyway, so from our template, we're, we're telling it how to create something that meets our requirements. And that's all on the template. So we're going to say, create an Nginx latest. Um, number two is the selector. Um, we're going to match labels. Uh, for that selector. So this is what I was saying about selectors. I've mentioned them before. So these labels that you can put whatever you want here, blue blarp, that's for you. And so when you're crafting uh, replica sets or daemon sets or any other sort of set, any, any, any controller in Kubernetes, you use the labels that you assign to pods that you create. And Kubernetes will monitor for those labels. So here we care about here, selector match labels, type is front end. So we are going to have this uh, in the template of what we're creating. We have a label type front end. So we are guaranteed, if you see in like the number three down there, we're guaranteeing three replicas running at any given time. And if there's not three replicas, then we will create one or kill one, depending on if we're over or under. Um, taking this one step further because, well, Kubernetes is great and all, but if you needed to like do a, a quick swap of your, your front end, if you're testing out a new feature, right, you're going to have to take everything down, right? So this is where deployments come in. Deployments are like replica sets, but better. Um, they're, they're essentially identical, um, but they can, you can upgrade the pods in what would be a replica set without any of them going offline. And the way that it does that is um, 
Kubernetes has its own internal DNS server. Um, if you're not familiar with the DNS server is, um, essentially you go to Google or you, you go to your web browser and you type google.com um, and then that, that, that string gets sent to a DNS server and DNS server will translate that to 8.8.8.8 .8 .8 .8 .8 and it'll send that traffic off to where it needs to go, right? So similarly, Kubernetes has its own internal DNS server, sort of like a virtual DNS. And um, though each, each sort of pod has its own name, right? Um, and it'll route things correctly for you. So when you create a deployment um, and you, let's say you update a deployment, let's say we, we wanna do a rollout, we wanna add some new pods, we wanna replace the existing pods that are running with something new. Well, what we can do is we can create a rollout and that will take the DNS server inside of Kubernetes and it'll route the traffic to the new pod, um, but it won't kill the old pod because if the new pod uh, fails, um, then it'll just it'll it'll continue as business as usual, right? So it won't it won't reroute that traffic until it's sure that the new pod that you're deploying has successfully spun up. Um, and there's many many different philosophies and ways to check if a, a pod is like alive. Something called liveness probes. I'm not going to get into that. We're going way beyond the span of our lives right now, but um, it's a good start. Um, this is what you would want to do if you're working on front end or back end. If you're deploying machine learning, that's critical as a microservice in the back end for Netflix, or if you're working for Amazon deploying a front end thing, right? Um, you want, if, if, if Amazon goes down for even five minutes, I mean, how much money is that lost? You know. So I hope that I have butchered that <laughs> explanation. Um, so here's, here's how you would actually interact with Kubernetes from a command line, right? And this is, um, I think these are called implicit commands. Yeah, they are implicit commands. Um, so you 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 create these YAML files, right? So here we have the first line, kubectl, uh, kubectl, kubectl. Um, that's sort of the the daemon that interacts with the Kubernetes daemon. Um, we apply a dash f for file, and then deployment def yaml. So we're going to apply that YAML file to the cluster, and it'll make any changes that that YAML file says that it needs. Uh, could be cuddle set image deployment deployment name blah 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 all you're doing there is you're changing the image used by a, a deployment so that's a way of updating it uh checking the rollout status again the rollout is like doing like a bait and switch uh, for pods so that you don't have any downtime rollout history is sort of like get branching sort of like a history obviously and you can undo that history with kubectl rollout undo um so if you're getting into this um, I'd say a good place to start uh, would be to play with replica sets a little bit because you probably don't need the uptime of deployments. Um, start with replica sets and I'm sort of doing them in a logical order that you would probably encounter them. Like jobs are very intuitive. They're very similar to like, oh, I'm running, I'm gonna run a Java program inside of my, you know, interpreter or whatever, I run it, oh, it works, okay, whatever. Now, now I'll move on, all right? And then the next thing logically would be, all right, well, we wanna make sure that we have this thing actually get up and be able to scale, um, followed by deployments where we can like scale as well as do like bait and switches and like live updates. So one thing at a time. Uh, the final concept we're gonna talk about here is namespaces. So in Kubernetes, uh, in a production environment, um, you are not allowed. <laughs> you are not allowed to push to prod. Typically what happens um, depending on where you work, actually, um, you need um, after going through the dev, the dev cluster, the test cluster, um, after having code review, after having um, DevOps or um, uh, a lead engineer's uh, night you a seal of approval. Um, only then will somebody push your code for you, or if you're lucky, you'll get to push it yourself to a prod cluster, right? But in Kubernetes, we can create separate namespaces, which sort of isolates things for us so that we don't accidentally screw anything up that we're not supposed to, right? And as much as it sounds like it's, it's oh, that's just like you being like over, over careful. It's really not. <laughs> I've screwed up a couple things um, that I'm not happy about, but luckily there were backups. Um, but yeah, the separation of duties is important. 
um, the separation of like, you know, access is, is, is super important for the livelihood of your cluster. And if you're working for like a for-profit company, um, going down for five minutes can cost an awful lot of money. Um, as well as like somebody getting a call at like 2 a.m. It's like, you got to come in the office, like you got to come fix this, you know, so. So yeah, so namespaces. Um, so here we are deploying the same thing three times across namespaces, right? And this prevents you from, um, you know, from screwing anything up you're not supposed to. But here's the cool thing is for some reason, I feel like reaching out from the prod cluster, which is in red, or the, the, the prod namespace, which is in red, to a service that's running in the green cluster or the green namespace, which is in green. Um, I can do that, um, provided that there aren't any roadblocks policy-wise, because you can create policies in Kubernetes to restrict the access from inside and outside of a namespace, as well as who's allowed to do what. Um, but I can access from outside of my namespace, provided that I use a fully qualified domain, domain name. And this is where uh, Kubernetes internal namespace really shines again, uh, because I can sort of so in, in so when I'm, when I'm in my own namespace right I can access things by their by the, just their name right because if you're all in the same house right there's there's a very small chance there's going to be more than one neck in my house right there's probably a zero chance so but if, if I go out into the world there's probably many of me there's probably a lot of necks so they the next logical thing would be to use my last name Nicholas Sassetti to find me, right? Or to access me or to, to talk to me or whatever. Same thing here. If in Kubernetes, you need to reach outside of your namespace, you can always use the fully qualified domain name for the pod or the service or the whatever, the resource you're trying to access. Um, and that could be useful for like security reasons. That could be bad for security reasons. These are all things you sort of need to think about as you're if you're if you're gonna you know take this on as like a hobby or as like a side passion or, or something you want to learn, you know you don't have to go you know fully security yet if you're just getting into it because that'll really slow you down a bit. But things you need to think about is like what are some very simple access vectors that you know a bad guy can use, or what can the dumbest person at my company <laughs> do if they get a hold of this and don't know what they're doing. Sort of the same thing. So I hear you saying, cool story, but what can I do with this, right? So fair, if I haven't given you enough proof yet, let's say you work for a small startup called, um, uh, well, crap, I, slow, I screwed that up. So <laughs> we're gonna talk about microservices first. Um, so microservice is highly maintainable, independently deployable, focused on delivering individual capabilities, right? Um, so now let's say you work for a small a little startup called Netflix, right? Um, and this is what your stack looks like, hypothetically, right? Um, and let's say that you have a pod, where's my mouse here? Let's say you have a pod running Nginx, right? You have Nginx talking to a backend, right? I, I'm, this is not a valid stack, I'm just saying. It's a good example. And this, this Nginx is talking to a backend of MongoDB and MongoDB will talk to or um, you know, have communications from a TensorFlow API, which is like a, a recommendation engine, an R Shiny app, right, or, or like a Scala distributed Spark job, whatever, whatever you're doing, doesn't matter, right, you can put anything you want there. Um, but let's say that Nginx can only handle three users at a time, right, or three billion or whatever, however you want to do it. Let's say that some unprecedented event, which makes people, that forces people to stay home and watch Netflix, um, I, I don't have any ideas there, uh, happens, and then you have twice the number of people at home watching Netflix at the same time, right, that's going to take down their Nginx server because it can't handle that many people, right? So now your service is down. Someone's getting a call at 3 a.m. to get up, get to the office. What happened? Something's broken. Go look at the logs, you know, SSH into the server, figure it out, whatever. Right? It's, going to, it's going to make people, it's going to make Netflix lose quite a bit of money. And even if not lose money from subscriptions, it's going to make people lose their confidence in their service. So, right, so this is where... Um, people might switch to Hulu because oh, whatever, it's up all the time or it's up right now anyway. So we can use a deployment here, right? And using certain tools, we can say, okay, if at any point in time we're monitoring this Nginx deployment and we see it start to throttle, we see like, you know, we get a couple more people on or we start to see it starting to slow down, 
uh, we can automate the deployment to add another pod for Nginx inside of that, that controller, right? And so now you can accommodate twice the number of people uh, and you can do this indefinitely, you know, for as, for as long as, for as, as many, as much computer resources as you have, right? So let's say that, um, let's say that your, your DevOps guy, right? The man behind, you know, man of Oz, like the guy behind the curtains, you know, the, the guys who like sit in a dark room and just kind of code with their laptops, right? Let's say they're going to switch from MongoDB to CockroachDB because that's what's all the rage now, right? Well, now normally that would require you rewriting um, your TensorFlow or like jumping back into like your Arshiny app or playing with Scala, like going back in your original code and like moving some things around to change the way it changed. Like if you hard, did you hard code it? Is there a certain API you need to use? Because uh, the, the JDBC connectors, the Java database connectors, they may not um, be compatible with this new database that you're supposed to be using. How do you possibly, you're gonna have to jump back in your code and you have all these applications now. So here's the great part about Kubernetes. And here's why I think, this is why I think it's, it's awesome. This is my selling point for Kubernetes is the fact that you can design just like object oriented programming and design patterns, you can easily design adapters uh, in your source code, right? You can, if you haven't taken, I don't remember the course, I think it's 439, uh, don't quote me on that. Um, but Lin Dung had taught a course on like object-oriented design patterns and you can design objects in such a way that you can like sort of hot swap them so that if you switch, you know, databases, it's very easy to do, to, to change that. But in Kubernetes, we can do that without writing any code. Like all you would have to do is create one adapter, right? So this is what it would look like, right? You can deploy another pod beside each of these or what you would actually do in practice um, is put um, another container next to each of those little microservices, right? Um, and then call it from there. But what that does is, okay, originally my TensorFlow was running on Mongo, right? And I had one database connector there, right? When I switch to CockroachDB, I can just swap out a new connector. So all I really have to do is change, really, I have to update one thing. I have to update the connector that I use, right? So instead of going into each application and changing where it's called from, I have to actually physically change code. Um, all I have to do is change the, the order that the pods are called. Um, so I would throw out the old database connector, right? So that's sort of like a, a, an intro to this. Microservice architectures encourage atomic container design that provide modularity, maintainability, and scalability. Uh, it's also really fun. It's a buzzword. People pay you more if you know it. Um, your resume will float to the top. It's, it's fun when it works. It's annoying when it doesn't. It's something you should learn. And I really hope that you've learned something today. Um, as I was talking to Emily earlier, so here's, here's my, my email. Um, it's like my personal professional or email. Um, we're, so I work for Army Research Lab. I work for Parsons Corporation, um, but we're looking for interns now. So if you're interested in something like that, um, we do, I was just telling Emily, we were doing, we, ha we do a lot of work with um, AR and VR. The guy on the right, I actually work with, um, I made a sticky note, Emily asked me, um, uh, like if I knew any sources, I don't personally know anything about AR or VR, but this guy does, and I'm very close with him, close friends with him. So um, yeah, so, so if you're interested in AR, VR, machine learning, if you're interested in big data, um, uh, servers, Linux, like, you know, reach out to me. Um, I can give you like a full proper spiel. I'm trying not to make this a sales pitch here, um, but we are interested in interns. So if you are interested or looking for something um, for the summer, I guess it would be the summer, uh, it would be entirely remote. Uh, you know, please send me an email uh, in your resume. Um, does anyone have any questions? I don't even know how many people are in the room right now. <laughs> it might have just been me talking to myself for a half an hour. Including us two, uh, there are four. There's four. Awesome. Okay. Someone just joined. Okay. If anyone has any questions, if not, I mean, that's totally fine. Um, it's kind of like a fire hose and Kubernetes, like looking at YAML files is very boring, I admit. Um, oh, and um, let me just point you to one more thing too. So if you go to my, um, my GitHub, 
S T R S T R I C K O L A S. It's a handsome mugshot. Pinned to my overview is TLDR, and um, there's a Kubernetes file or folder, right? And here's a bunch of info on Kubernetes. So if this is something that you're willing to get in, if you're interested in getting into, the documentation is kind of abysmal and non-linear. This is very linear. There's a couple memes in the middle. Like it's, it's. I, I would say that it's pretty floaty. Yeah, there's some memes and GIFs and stuff. There's some, you know, things to help you along. Um, so yeah, I hope that is of help to you if you're interested in this. Um, and I'll open the floor to any questions because I'm going on for too long now, I think. I have a question. Sure. Um, so how does um, Docker files play into this, like custom Docker files? Mm. OK. So OK, that's a good question, actually. Um, because in my experience, I've only ever so I've only ever pulled from Docker Hub, right? Um, I have to get back to you on that. I actually do. I actually genuinely do because I have only pulled legitimately from Docker Hub. I have never deployed like a custom Docker container because um, everything I do, um, I just I just do like expressions or whatever, and, and you know, yeah. So that's a good question, though. Would you also recommend, um, I know there's a couple of cloud solutions for Kubernetes. Like I think Google Cloud Platform offers one and probably AWS, would you recommend <laughs> using them or uh, like creating your own machine if you're just like wanting to play around with it? So Google GCP and AWS do have cloud offerings. Beware of serverless. Um, serverless has become sort of a buzzword nowadays. Um, serverless is great in theory, but the spin up time for a serverless microservice is not, it's not worth it in my opinion. Um, there are certain caveats too. So, okay. So when I deploy, so, okay, I'm going all over the place here. So I took it upon myself to buy a bunch of Raspberry Pis and try to do it on, on bare metal. That's not economically feasible. And honestly, I've dumped more money into it than I had anticipated. So if that's probably not the best, right? Um, I would say give GCP a chance. Um, I haven't used it myself. There are caveats. There's differences between the, uh, the, the connectors that you would use on a bare metal machine versus what you would use on like GCP or AWS. They have their own, um, there's something called key stores. Um, the key store is sort of what it sounds like, sort of like an Apple keychain or I don't know what Linux has, the key vault or whatever. So, so there's there's ways that you authenticate SSL traffic and stuff like that, right? So AWS and GCP have their own ways of doing it. And Azure has its own way to do it too. Azure's kind of a, not a great platform in my opinion. Um, but yeah, I would say, I would say it's worth a shot. If you have, I'd say if you have some credits, um, Cloudera is also great. Um, that might take a little more work to get set up, but I think you'll have less restrictions. Um, and Linode or Linode, I don't know how to pronounce that one, but that's all, another great one too to check out. So yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Anything else? I don't know if we have a chat. Um, yeah, we do. Um, but I don't think anyone asked any questions yet. Okay, that's fine. Oh, battery low. Yeah, just let me know when you want me to stop recording. Oh. I don't know how far into QA you want me to mm -hmm. go. Nope. Um, so I guess if no one has any other questions, we'll leave it there. Um, my email is on screen. Oh, my email is now on screen. Um, feel free to send me an email if you have any questions. If you have trouble with Kubernetes, like I'll try to help you as much as I can. I'm not an expert by any means, purely a hobbyist, tinker. Um, and if you're interested in an internship, so long as you're a US citizen, uh, please reach out to me. Okay. There is now a question in chat. Okay, what's up? Um, the question is, where do you see the future of containerization going? Where do I see the future of containers? Sorry, I have to get my charger. The future of containers. <clears throat> hmm. Um, 
So one of the, the newest things now is, is serverless. And that's where like GCP, I, I haven't particularly played with serverless, but I have worked with them quite a bit. And the thought of serverless is like you spin up like a particular function inside of a container. And that function in a container runs once and then dies, right? Um, That has a lot of spin up time and I don't, I don't personally have a use for it, but that's a huge direction that people are really excited about is serverless architectures. Um, I think that moving towards like moving away from like the monolith where we just have one application and that's our thing and having everything broken down is, is a great idea. Um, I think that the, the next step to take, um, to Kubernetes. The next step to take Kubernetes would be to have um, like super distributed clusters where you have like, um, like everybody buys like a router or like, you know, like the router that you get from like Comcast or Xfinity or, or Verizon or whatever. And each of those has a small compute cluster in it, like is part of a larger compute cluster. And, and, and everyone can leverage all of those resources just by, you know, like the downtime when you're sleeping and your, your router isn't directing much traffic, it's not consuming that much electricity. I don't know. I don't know the, the future of, of containers. I'm just, you know, a starry eyed hobbyist. <laughs> I don't know, so. I played around with serverless containers before because uh, Google Cloud Platform just released one, and I think AWS also has a similar service. It's called Cloud Run. Mm -hmm. um, it's really interesting, but I think if you have larger containers, it's not very cost effective, if that makes sense. No. You it's have perfect. to, sorry. No, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. I'm like, agreeing with you. You have to really have very slim containers, so you have to have a really good um, compilation process or something uh, for it to work pretty well. Yeah. Um, Cause some Docker containers can be gigabytes. Yeah. Um, you can, you, you know what build phases are? You yes, build, I think. Build phases. Um, yeah, yeah. So you can like, um, you can have a multi-phase Docker build container and like, like if you need to compile something, you can pull the compiler and then compile the thing, move the binary, and then just throw it away. So that's one way to get around like container sizes. But yeah, I, I, I genuinely don't, I can't think of an instance where um, you would need a serverless thing ex unless it's for like something that's so seldom used, right? It's, it's a service that's so seldom used that you may only need it like once or twice, or let's say like a dozen times a year, I don't know, right? That's the only thing I can think of. That might be relevant, but I don't know. The geniuses at Google know more than I do, so I don't know. 